All righty. First of all, I want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, we're going to dive in a little bit on the Minn Kota side, but most of the time we're going to spend a lot of majority of the time talking about sonar, uh, side imaging, down imaging, 360, and live, what y'all came here to uh, learn about. Hummingbird users, Helix, Solix, Apex, Solix, Helix, Helix, Helix. So we got a little bit of everybody. Uh, so we're gonna, we'll touch on the basic menu settings on, on all three units since we have all three here. Uh, but first I want to talk about, does anybody have the new Quest trolling motor? Uh, so for those of you who have not seen the new Quest, it is back here on this Falcon boat if you want to come look at it. But uh, this is significantly more quiet, more powerful than a, your traditional Ultrax or any trolling motor on the market today. It is brushless, 24, 36 volt. Uh, so I'd highly encourage to come check that out. I uh, just wanted to touch on that as that is new for this year. One cool feature with this uh, Ultrax trolling motor is our battery monitoring system new for this year. Uh, when you plug this into your Hummingbird graph, you can actually get your voltage, um, run time, and battery percentage, whether you're running lead acid um, or uh, lithium batteries. So for those of you who are not running lithium batteries and you have a lead acid system, you can plug this in and actually see your battery percentage there. So most of you are familiar with the families of units. We have uh, Helix, Solix, and Apex. For those of you who are new to Hummingbird, uh, Helix is kind of the baseline non-touch screen model. That's probably the most popular model that uh, we have in the lineup. But then you can bump up to Solix and Apex, uh, which you get your touch screen and bigger size units, for those of you who are not familiar with that. Um, how many people are running Lake Master? So this is probably the most important tool on your boat uh, for two reasons. A, for navigational purposes and for um, giving you the map to find potential areas of interest. It's gonna show you your ledges, your humps, your points, everything that you're gonna have potential to graph and have graphing success. This is the uh, kind of the map to that. Uh, without this, you can you know you can go out there all you want to, but you're you're essentially lost without this. So for those of you have not do not have map cards, this is a must-have. Uh, we have two versions, a regular and a premium. Um, the only difference between the regular and the premium is our shaded relief and Google overlay. I highly encourage uh, the premium card. It's worth the extra 50 bucks. Just because you can simply go in here to the Helix uh, menu twice under the Hummingbird uh, setup tab, go down to layers and simply check shaded relief and Google overlay on and your map will instantly look like this. It all shades it for you. It'll shade it from red all the way out to zero to five, then transition to orange, yellow, green, light blue, and dark blue. Uh, it makes it really easy to see and it makes the contours pop because of that 2D shaded relief. The regular will not have these two features, but you can still do your uh, chart depth highlights. So you can have five with those. Most of you, if you have the older Lake Master, you only have the shallow water highlight in red and then one, your one depth highlight. With this regular card, you can do uh, zero to five in red, five to 10 in green, five to 15 in another color and vice versa. So you can, you can expand your map and custom shade your map however you want to on that. So this is, Probably one of the most important tools on your boat. If you do not have a map card, I highly encourage you to come down here to Bucks Island and grab a map card if you're a Hummingbird user. Do um, you have a VX card for like 360 overlay? Uh, no, you do not have one. No? Nope. Okay, because then I need a Lake Master card. Correct. That. Yep. And there's several versions with this. We have several versions of legacy Lake Master cards, and then we have this new uh, Lake Master pre uh, Premium a VX card here. The VX will only work for Helix Gen 3 and Gen 4, all Solix and all Apex. So if anybody out there has a Gen 1, Gen 2, or older uh, Helix unit, you will still need to run the older Lake Master card there, which most of y'all are good. Uh, y'all units are, are compatible with this new VX card there. Same thing with your Lake Master. You're still going to have your shallow water highlight, your depth highlight there that you can adjust under Helix menu twice, go to HB chart and you can do your depth highlights there and shallow water highlight as well as your water level offset. So for anybody fishing Smith Lake or anywhere the lake draws down, 
you can go to water level offset, decrease that if the lake's down, increase it if the lake's up, and it automatically you know, adjusts the contours for you there. Um, with the Solix, all you have to do is either come up here to the top left bar and hit chart, or click the three lines on the keypad there. And you can scroll down to your water level offset and your chart highlights there. Uh, for your Solix and Apex to get to your shaded relief and your Google overlay, there is just a, um, there's three lines, like looks like a layering option there. Just click that and check them on. Very easy to get to with your Solix and Apex. Any questions about Lake Master? So a part of that Lake Master um, is our new One Boat Network app. Um, with this, you can download this, uh, create an account, and there is a yearly subscription that you can pay $24.99 to get all the whole United States Lake Master Premium card. Um, so if you want to have access on your iPhone or iPad at nighttime, if you're a tournament angler looking for the lake you know, the day before you fish, you can access this um, on your uh, Apple or Android device here with this. When you buy a VX card, make sure there is a coupon code in the box on every Lake Master card box. Do not throw away the box because you can use that coupon code to apply it to this app to get 12 months free subscription um, for the whole United States. Any questions about Lake Master before we move in? Just all sonar. So this is relative to um, every brand here. This is just frequency and this is 100% sonar. So um, with this, on the 83200 side, that's gonna be your 200, uh, that's gonna be your 2D cone, right? That's gonna be your uh, lower frequency cone there. Um, on the 83200, as you get to 455, 800, and 1.2 megahertz, uh, that is what Hummingbird is known about, is the highest frequency range with side imaging and down imaging. So one thing to note about sonar and frequencies, just remember the higher the frequency go, you go, the better resolution you're going to get. However, the higher frequency you go, the less range you're going to get. So when you start side scanning um, and scanning down imaging deeper water, the deeper you are and the further out you shoot, Using the mega frequency beam, it's going to start to black out, you know, past about 100 foot. So if you're wanting to scan far distances or you're in really deep water, bump it down to 455. For the Helix guys, the easiest way to do it is just simply hit the check mark and you can toggle between 455, 800, and 1.2 megahertz. Solix, you can just go at the top bar up there and there is a little preset 455, 800, and 1.2 megahertz there. But just remember on this, it kind of depends on where you're fishing and how you're fishing and the depth you're fishing. But if you want to scan at range, bump it down to 455. You're in really deep water, bump it down to 455. Otherwise, uh, use Mega most of the time. Is that that's going to you know give you your best detailed image there? So this is another important uh, tool that we get asked all the time. We get asked you know at all these shows. How do we get you know, your picture to look like these that you're seeing here? Um, and this is one of the most important tools that I, that I teach here is in this particular example, uh, this is on the Warrior River here. I idled this point, the fish were on the up current side, ideal. I graphed and I just idled straight down this navy dotted line one time and I drew this middle picture here. Well, yeah, I knew there's, there's obviously a school of fish there that are you know, 12 or 15, but it didn't really look that good. So just by changing my angle slightly and going over at the yellow line, just by changing it 45 degrees, then I drew the next picture over, just by changing my angle one time. So just because you see something on down imaging, side imaging, that you go over it one time and it's like, ah, I didn't really see much that time. If you know it's a good brush pile, I encourage you to just take an extra 30 seconds and just scan over it at a different angle because it could draw you a completely different picture and you you know your settings are identical so so just because it shows up one way just change the angle and uh, look at it again and you'll be shocked at what you're gonna see especially with brush piles there's like a prime example um, in one of these simulation where it's a tree laid over perfect with crappie all in it um, they just knew the exact angle to draw that picture um, so they, they idled over it at that exact angle.
So side imaging is your boat position is in the middle there um, and the black is the water column. So with this beam, it essentially goes straight down and out. So what you're seeing in the water column is essentially an upside down ice cream cone that is cut in half. Half of it's displayed on this left hand side, half of it's displayed on the right hand side there. Um, and then of course you're going to get your 90 foot out. Uh, one thing with this, when you're setting up your range, just remember the deeper you are, the water column is going to take the majority of your screen. So for instance, if you're scanning 90 foot and you're in 50 foot of water, you know, the water column is going to take up the majority of the screen and that's 90 foot of compressed image there that's going to be very difficult to see any type of bass or any type of smaller object that you're trying to see there. So once again, adjust your range based on your depth that you're in. Most of the time around here on the river that we're shallower enough that it, it's not going to matter. You can scan 80 to 100 foot, but if you ever go to Smith Lake or Martin, any of those deeper places, make sure to keep your range about three times your depth there just to keep the image proportionate on the screen there. Side imaging is like a flashlight. I essentially just get it right here, turn it on, and idle. I'm going to see your shadow. I'm going to see your shadow at the angle that I go by. So shadows are a huge deal with um, how you read side imaging. This particular example you can see on the right hand uh, water column there, you can see bait fish and game fish there and they're up off the, the, uh, the bottom so you can see your fish, uh, the shadows casted further on the screen. If a brush pile is sticking all the way up out of the water, of course the shadow is going to cast all the way across the screen. If the object is close, then the shadow is going to be right next to it. And this is standard for any brand that you use here. Most of the time I always keep my side imaging in the mega frequency range just because I want it the, the most detail. But if you're scanning a flat and you want to scan 150, 200 foot, uh, you can bump that down to 455 and, and get that range if you're not wanting any detail there. Settings wise, um, this is uh, particular to Hummingbird Helix you're going to go to your express menu. So in this particular example here, we have side imaging pulled up. We're just going to hit menu one time and it's going to pull up your express menu. That's where you're going to adjust your sensitivity and contrast, color palette and range. The two biggest things to adjust always are sensitivity and contrast. Sensitivity and contrast, there is no set number that I could tell you that it's going to be good everywhere. My unit's different than his, yours is different than his. We could have the, all the exact same Humminbird unit and I may have different numbers than you all. So that is something that you're always going to have to play with. Um, you can get in the ballpark. Every unit that I've ever been on, usually on Helix um, and Solix, I bump my side image in between 12 and like 16 on sensitivity and contrast. But depending on where you go, depending on the weather, depending on the sunlight, depending on how the water conditions are, make you adjust the number up or down a number, just depending on the different weather conditions there. So that is not a set number. I always try to go up more than 10 um, on sensitivity and contrast, but like I said, that is just something you're just gonna have to play with a few numbers back and forth there. With your range, that depends on your depth. Your chart speed, I like to put mine on five and to just put my boat in gear. The faster you go, the image of course is gonna get distorted a little bit. Uh, I like just put my boat in gear and it'll run around 3.1, 3.3 miles an hour uh, with side imaging. Side imaging is made to go kind of in a straight line. When you turn, it's going to get the image distorted a little bit. So try to go off, you know, buy an object in a, as straight as possible there. Color palettes, of course, are just personal preference. I like the blue, but that's just me. So whatever y'all run, either the amber is another popular one. Um, that is all personal preference for you. Any questions about side imaging? This is just another example showing hard bottom, soft bottom. We all know bass like hard bottom places. Um, you can tell the difference uh, between the dark image and the bright white image there between hard and soft bottom there. And you can see the brush pile obviously close to the bottom the reason the shadow's right there next to it there. For those of you who want to see what bass look like, this is all schools of bass on the Tennessee River. Uh, these were taken, this is a Solix and then two Helix pictures there. Um, 
a lot of times I won't even see, you know, a rice grain on side imaging with a shadow behind it. Oftentimes, just like I got a, like a pen and I just drew some lines in the screen. As you can see on this far left, uh, you can see just like a lot of just lines and dashes in the screen. That's what a lot of times they're going to look like. A lot of times you won't see the actual white dot with the shadow behind it. Um, most of the time you'll just see, of course, the shadow. Um, this all depends, of course, on the angle that you go over the school of fish on. Uh, the far right example, in that particular example, you can see every white dot with a shadow close to them. But this is all a school of bass um, on the Tennessee River here on what they look like. <coughs> Any questions about side imaging? So for our down imaging, uh, this is the same thing that's showing straight down underneath the water column and side imaging there. Um, this starts from the right and moves to the left, so your new data is going to be on the far right. So everything under that zero is straight down underneath you. Um, everything else is past history. Now, one thing that Helix and or Solix and Apex can do is they can actually scroll back. So if you miss something, you it actually records it for a, a pretty good while. Helix, once it goes past the screen here, you're you have to redo it or you know, just mark it and then try to get as close as possible. So. Solix and Apex can record that data there. On down imaging, fish are going to look like fish is a white dot. A uh, tree is just going to draw a tree. Biggest thing with trying to get a picture to look like this is the angle that you go over that tree. If you just miss it slightly, the image will get distorted a little bit. So same thing, sensitivity, contrast. It's identical to side image in there, and setting that up and getting to the setup tab is the same way. Uh, when you put it on a full screen down image in view there, when you hit menu once, it's going to pull up your express menu, and you're only going to adjust your sensitivity, contrast, and down range there. I like to keep my down range a consistent image. This is across whether you're running uh, 2D down image in or mega live. I like to keep my down range about five to ten foot deeper than my depth there just to keep the image proportionate and consistent. When you have it in auto it's always jumping up, jumping down. Um, I like to keep it at a down set range. So this particular example we're in 42 foot I would put it at about 50 foot there in auto. Chart speed the same. Uh, color palette of course is a personal preference there. So it just depends. So deeper water, um, I like to put it in 455. Um, if I want to get a really good detail image on brush pile per se, then I'll keep it in mega. But most of the time, I like to keep it in 455 just because the, 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 the beam is a little bit broader and you can pick up a little bit more. Um, it's a little bit less room for error there. So you can see more, but if you're you wanted to see like a really good clean crisp image or you say you want to see crappie in a brush pile or whatever um, and make it look good then keep it in mega but I would say 95% of the time I run it in 455. Yep. The one good thing with this um, there is a setting especially for like right now with the rivers high and muddy when you launch your boat, you're going to get so much particles in the water column, it'd be very difficult to actually graph efficiently on your down imaging. One setting is water column sensitivity. Helix, you have to go menu twice under the sonar tab. It's like six from the bot or six from the, the top bar. You'll see water column sensitivity. When you set that to negative one or negative two, it'll automatically clear up all that clutter, that microparticles, that turbulence in the water uh, from the mud or silt in the water. Solix, you're on that main bar where your sensitivity and contrast are. So if you want to increase the sensitivity, so if you want to make it pop or make it really bright white and fish show up really bright white, you can increase that to one or two and it'll make it really pop. Otherwise, the only time I really use it or is when the conditions are, you, you can't see anything, it's all blown out, then I'll just decrease it to one or two and it'll, automatic, it'll make it a clear, pretty black screen there. This is what some fish look like. Uh, these are all bass and bait fish on that right-hand side um, of what bass look like on 
uh, down image in. This particular example, you can see I'm on Mega, but I am going over a bridge and I wanted to get the detail of the bridge actual column there. That's why I did that. But most of the time, like that one's in 455 there. Any questions about down image in? So the next type of sonar, this one has been around for years. This is kind of the basis for all sonar in general. This has been out for years and years and years. Um, and this is essentially what started uh, down imaging and side imaging, the sonar wave. It's 2D sonar. This is kind of slowly starting to filter out with live sonar and all this other good technology. Um, you know, 2D is not as irrelevant as it was, you know, year, 20 years ago, 15, 10 years ago at least. Um, but your fish are gonna show up as more of an arch. Uh, bait fish is gonna look like a cloud there. Um, and you have narrow and wide chirp. Same particular example if you want to go from 455 to mega. Essentially here, narrow, going to be a more detailed beam. Wide is going to be a more broader. You can pick up more objects there with this. This is just a uh, different clear mode or max mode. Um, if you want to get a little bit more detailed, uh, this is particularly for people back when we, before forward-facing sonar, and you were actually trying to see your lure on 2D sonar at the front, or you'd put it in max mode and you can see your drop shot uh, worm and bait better. Oftentimes now, there's not many people running 2D sonar actually looking at their bait anymore, so this is kind of starting to fade out. Same thing that I talked about, adjusting sensitivity and contrast, chart speed, uh, et cetera. All is identical to down imaging on your 2D sonar there. How many people have Mega 360? So for those of you who don't, this is actually a tool that goes on the actual shaft of the trolling motor or on the uh, mounts of the, on your Fortrex or Ultrex. Um, and it is essentially like a rotating side imaging display transducer. Um, it rotates and sweeps every 180 degrees. And this is essentially gives you a good situational awareness around your boat at all times. So you could be fishing down a bank and fishing down this bank for 10 years and you just cast it at the bank and then all of a sudden you get a 360 and there is a stump out there you never knew that was, or, you know, remotely there. So it just gives you, you know, it, it makes you aware of your surroundings when you're fishing wherever you are there. So like I said, rotates every 180 degrees. You'll see new data and old data there. Um, and you read it the same as you do side imaging. I keep this one in mega pretty much exclusively. Um, and you're going to tell what objects are based on the shadows they cast, just like side imaging. This just essentially goes on your trolling motor. And this is what some bass look like on your mega 360. Um, this particular example, you know, you could see them over here to the left um, under bass. I usually don't draw the two circles on the right, but I did tonight um, because oftentimes you'll get caught up in seeing these over there to the left, but you'll miss the bigger ones over here to the right that you never know they're there. And every time that thing sweeps, you'll see the fish move to the north corner, to the south corner. You're constantly seeing them move around your boat at all times there. Uh, with live sonar, you have to kind of keep up with them, and then maybe you catch one, and your pant, you know, they could be over here by the time you jump back up there. So this is a good tool that, okay, I just caught one there, I just put in the live well, I go back up there, and now they're in the northwest corner over there. So I can make that cast or pan over there and uh, throw to them. So this is not uh, just a structure finding tool. This thing can uh, find fish uh, pretty, pretty good. One common misconception with this is this boat icon. This boat icon is actually the pod's location, not the actual full boat. So the pod is here. The full, actually, back of the boat is uh, back here where this, uh, the black lines are casted. That is actually the beam hitting off my back of the motor. Do you normally run yours forward? So what I do with mine, because I'm running a split screen mapping and 360, so I'll do like a 30-70 split and I'll do my range out to 110 and then zoom in twice. So it accesses that full picture there. 
A lot of people will use the front view uh, if they're running on one unit specifically, but if you split it, you're gonna have to run that full 360 view. But when you increase the range and zoom in twice, it, it really blows it up on the screen there. But if you had a dedicated unit, then you can just do the front view. And this is what I was talking about with, with um, the front view on your display mode. You can change it to, from 360. So when, I, when you zoom in twice, like we're zoomed in four times, and it, see how it just bulked up the screen and you're using actual the whole screen's potential? Um, that is what I do with that. Uh, sensitivity and contrast, I've, I really like sensitivity around that 12 to 15, somewhere around there. And then contrast, I leave around that 10 or 11. Uh, it's been good everywhere that I've ever been, uh, but like I said, it changes depending on what unit you have. The 360 color palettes, I like one. I like the blue color palette, but like I said, that is personal preference there. The 360 speed, um, so three is kind of the magic number that uh, we always use. There is some situations where I'm spot locked and I know I'm fishing there, you may can you know, put it on two and get a really pretty image, but seam three is kind of the magic number with that. Anything more than that, you're, you're, it's gonna kind of blur the image a little bit there because it's going too fast. That dynamic contrast, what do you, what is it? So it is just an extra con, uh, contrast setting. Me, it, it seems to darken out the image a little bit. I don't like mine on. It, like I said, that is a, a setting that you can play with. I always turn mine off, but you can run it on low or um, balanced or whatever, and you can you can test that. But it seems to, when you turn it on, you're at the distance. Like in this particular example, we're looking 90 foot. When you turn that on, it seems to black out. So you you know that past 80 foot just starts to fade out there because of the mega image and beam there. Good question. You can mark waypoints on this. If you have a um, new trolling motor, an older iPilot Link trolling motor, or our Humminbird heading sensor, uh, you can mark waypoints. Um, your navigation on 360 needs to be turned on for the waypoints to show up there. Um, and that is under the menu twice under the accessories tab there. Uh, but I highly encourage getting a heading sensor, or if you have a trolling motor that is a Link or a newer trolling motor, uh, because it is a pretty useful tool to be able to mark waypoints on you using your 360 screen. So you don't have to have a heading sensor to do it? Do you if, a yes, if you have a link trolling motor or one of the new ones there. The yep, it'll use it internally. Yep. Otherwise, if you have the older iPilot link, um, you'll need that Hummingbird heading sensor. So with this, this is uh, of course our mega live. This is kind of where everything is gone, right? Everything is, every, all the talk is forward facing sonar now. Um, with this particular example, uh, how many people are running forward facing sonar? So this is um, the same beam as one of the competitor, a 20 by 120 here. So what I'm talking about goes for um, one of them is to kind of go hand in hand because the beams are the same here. In forward mode, you're looking a, you know, 20 degrees out, right? So in this particular example, we're shooting 20 degrees out at 45 foot here. What a lot of people don't realize is as it displays on the screen, say at 45 foot, that beam is 15.9 foot wide. So let's just say there's a fish there at the circle, and I make a cast down that red dotted line there. I see my lure and I see the fish in the screen and I see my lure just on it like I feel like I'm about to snag the fish. I mean, I come so close to them. Well, in reality, I may be four foot off and I see both of them in the screen because of the way the beam stretches out. Same thing with a 35 foot example. I cast at that brush pile and it's the brush pile is at the triangle there. I missed that brush pile by three foot and I saw both of them in the screen, and I think I'm coming right through it every time. So with this, you're gonna have to pan back and forth and try to get, because you can tell by the fish or the brush pile as it starts to fade out of the beam and when it gets dead in the middle of the beam there. So just because you threw at a fish and you see your lure come right by the fish and it didn't do anything, 
odds are you missed it by three foot. It didn't see it because bass are pretty curious. So when you get the bait in front of them, they'll, they'll follow you all the way to your feet, majority of the time, if, you, if they see your bait. So with this, especially when you're chasing fish in this particular example, you may want to just follow them a little bit. Follow them for like two or three seconds and try to get the direction that they're going and try to lead them is obviously the ideal. And the, the guys that are really good at this, they can follow them for two or three seconds, process that information, and cast in front of them and present that bait, and the, the fish will see it every single time. That's what makes them really good at this and makes you know the average guy that doesn't practice with this or use this very often, they think that they're you know reeling their bait right by the fish, but they may be missing them by a few feet, even though you're seeing them in the same screen there. So the further you're looking out and the further you're looking at 80 or 100 foot, the more margin for error that you have there. Mm -hmm. I like to run my Mega Live on uh, six clicks up um, in 60 degrees. So what I mean by that is you start in a down mode, click it up six clicks um, in forward mode. So it kind of gives the strength of the beam out because I want to see kind of out because I'm a bass guy. I like to run mine on 80 to 100 foot. So I kind of want to know what's out there at distance. Um, and then sensitivity and contrast is something you're going to have to play with. If you want to see your bait more, I like to run my contrast down and sensitivity up. The higher the contrast is, yeah, it gets it a clean, pretty screen there, but it's harder to see smaller baits. So I like to run my contrast down, sensitivity up. And you'll get maybe a little bit of fuzz in the screen, but you can see your bait as far as you can throw it. Down range is another thing, just like down imaging, I like to keep it consistent. So if I'm in 20 foot, put it on 30 foot. You want to keep your live sonar consistent. That way you can start telling the size of the fish. Everything is going to be relative. If your sonar is jumping around and you're always jumping sonar, like you can see one second a, you know, a pound bass look like a six pound bass. But if you keep that consistent range there, it's going to look tiny on the screen. So keep that range at a consistent level. And that is across all sonar brands, which everyone uses. That is not exclusive to the Mega Live. So down imaging, side imaging, Mega Live, Try to keep everything consistent based on the depth that you're in. Any questions about forward? In doing that, if you wanted to crop your fish around fields and stuff, mm -hmm. and your boat's in six, seven, eight foot of water, and it's shooting up under that, and then it just gradually getting shallower as it goes up. Yep. Mm -hmm. Any tips on keeping it clean and clear? So. Put your downrange at a consistent level. So you said six or seven foot, put it on maybe 12 and keep it there. No matter if you're shooting up there at three foot, just keep it down where your boat is. Um, you can, I played with the, uh, the dynamic contrast a little bit or low balance and high. And one of those, you use, I run mine on balanced a lot of the time, um, which is another setting that you can use. But if you want to, specific to crappie fishing and how far are you looking up under there 40 uh, foot 15 to 25 okay so and you bump your range down forward range don't run it on like 60 foot and it's just taken up so bump that down to like 30 foot and really tone it down there and then you'll be able to see a little bit more uh, especially a lot of crappie guys they don't really run you know distance like our bass guys our bass guys are run 110 foot and not bad an eye but the crappie guys like to tone it down and catch the fish within 25 foot of them realistically uh, so do that just bump your forward range in you know probably to 30 foot um, and then your down range keep it at one consistent level there you can turn on your grid lines and the only reason that I like to have these turned on whenever you purchase Mega Live is just to kind of get a size proportion. If you're a tournament angler and you kind of want to cast at the bigger fish, uh, this just box gives you something to relate the blob to. So if the blob is taking up a quarter of the rectangle, I kind of divide it in fours. So if it's taking up a quarter and you catch it and it's a four pound fish, then you know, have a mental picture that, okay, that blob is, you know, bigger than, it takes up more than a quarter of that actual, uh, that box, so it's you know a four-pound caliber fish, and then we have down mode. Um, like I said, most of the time everybody's running you know their live in forward mode, so this is not you know 
as big of a deal, but this essentially just straight down underneath you. You can tilt the transducer, all of them can do this. Uh, but this particular mode, landscape is being more and more used um, by across all sonar brands. A lot of people are running two transducers uh, just to run this mode and in forward mode. So essentially this just tilts the transducer up and you're getting 120 degrees kind of live there. Uh, this is really useful in shallow water. Uh, a lot of guys are bed fishing with it now because you can actually see the fish swimming around um, actual down there live. So this is getting a, a more and more catching on every every single month. More and more people are doing this. Would that work well on the piers like I was talking about? Yes, sir, it sure would. How shallow? Uh, it really works well in like five foot or less. Yeah, that's what I use mine a lot now because I've fished five, five and less. Five. Yeah, really well in five foot. Yeah, all the way to the bank, is that right? I'm pretty close. Mm -hmm. You see a lot, like there'll be a log. I use this a lot, so you you can see the logs and the tires and everything in the water. Mm -hmm. So I it, only need wide for you. Well, that's why that's I was right. going to say I, I want to mount one backwards so I can see behind me. Front and back. Yep. That's right. That's right. Really good shallow water tool here. If you change that angle to come out on the porch and seat the key down, would that help the director in the forward about going shooting under the pier on the shallow stuff? You probably could bump it down to four, 40, um, because of the way you're bringing the, um, the range in. Because at distance, you want to have that transducer tilted up because you're looking 100 foot. Close. Yep. So whenever you're 30 foot or less, you may can tilt that thing down to even three clicks because you're only looking from here to the wall over there, realistically. So you may can turn it down to 30 and just kind of go by, okay, I'm, I'm shooting my range 30 foot out. Let's just turn it to three clicks and try it. So that may be, you know, that may help prevent the beam from shooting, kind of getting too much out of the water column or getting too much of the pier in your beam. Say if you was fishing and you had it set up forward right now, and you had it dialed in perfect, you pull it back of the pocket and you want to go landscape mode. You set up that thing up in landscape mode, does your sensitivity and contrast going to change that much? Because of the Probably will, because uh, it's a different image. Uh, but all you have to do with the ours is just, you know, press the two tabs press it up and then you have to go in there to your menu once and then change it from forward to landscape on your display mode uh, with this. One thing I didn't mention on Megalive specifically is make sure all, everything is off, off auto, whether it be the degrees that you're tilting up and your display mode. So don't leave any of those in auto, put it all in forward mode and then put it in whatever degree or how many clicks you have up, put that um, off of auto on those. You have to change it, yep. So change it from forward to landscape as you uh, tilt the transducer up. And that's just simply just clicking the menu once. Um, oh, and then with the Solix and Apex, you just go up to the top bar and you can quickly change it. Any questions about this? So the next tool, this is just an independent live mount specifically for Mega Live. Um, this is called our Target Lock. Um, this just mounts on our Ultrax style motors, and what it does is just a directional lock. No, it will not lock on fish. It will lock on a heading, you know, based on the direction that brush pile is. So you're just going to point it over there, and there is a pedal that you can actually press and target lock on that particular object, and then still spot lock with your trolling motor. So you're actually not going to give up your spot lock capability because when you have your live on the shaft, you either kind of have to stay on it. When you spot lock, you're giving away, you know, that live because, you know, the motor's just going to be sweeping back and forth here. Um, this has a pedal so you can steer it left and right, as you can see on the, on the right-hand view there. Um, if you do have an older Ultrex iPilot link or any of the new motors, uh, there is a setting that you can program that foot pedal to. It's called Minn Kota Steer. Um, and you can quickly press that button and the head and the target lock follow each other. Uh, so that way when you're fishing down a bank, you can run it in Minn Kota steer and just follow. And then when you want to actual target lock on an object, you can just press the target lock when you see that. Is it possible to have that or leave it on a trolling motor to have 
two plant fishes, one that's on landscape and one that's on forage. So you can cannot you run that off of just one unit? No. So you'd have to plug it into a different unit. Okay. And it'd be independent because one live is going to your five port switch, the other one you'd have to plug into another unit, you're probably gonna get some interference there. This is just some more information on Minn Kota Steer and the One Boat Network button there. Any other questions? We'll leave it up to questions now. I've seen some people doing 24 volt heat sinks. Is that kind of? Mm -hmm. what, is there any benefit to that? So ours will only do up to 20 volts, our units. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of people are running 16 volts now. Um, and 16 volt is, is a good, it just maintains high voltage the whole time, right? It's just, you're, you're still going to get 12 volts of current to the unit, but you're going to maintain that, you know, that threshold above. You're going to have good voltage to the unit all day long if you're running that 16 volt battery. And these units like to see, they don't monitor amperage, they monitor voltage. Correct. And so it starts dimming down when you drop below like, what, 12 and a half? Yeah, that's right. So it just keeps it above that, that number so the unit itself don't start dumbing down. That's right. And I will say you'll see it usually on 360 first. Yeah. You'll lose half your image. That's right. So there really is a benefit for a 16 volt electronic. There's, there's a benefit for anything over 12 and a half volts. So even if you use a 12, if you use a 12 volt lithium battery, it maintains over 12 mm -hmm. and a half volts all the all time. All the time. Yep. Until it's about to go dead, and then right. you start losing that benefit. Yep. So with a 16 volt, you won't ever hit that threshold. That bottom threshold. Off. Yep. Yep. Mm -hmm. You're talking about running an independent battery for what? Yeah. For what if you run a lithium starting battery? It, it'll still work. Um, I, I have found that sometimes you have a tendency of getting a little more interference when you have both components hooked to that battery, yeah. which is why I like to I like to suggest people have an actual independent battery because you never know what your engine's going to do. Sometimes the engine being hooked up, there could be a short on the engine that would cause interference. Just mm -hmm. something slight, just something small that could cause interference on your graph. <coughs> So if you run stuff independently, you know that if you have an interference issue, it's probably something to do with the wires going from um, that battery to your graph, maybe around, twisted around some other wire that's got power to it. Right. It's easier to find where, where, where your issues are when you got an independent battery. Okay. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite battery to run? Your setup. I run Impulse in mine. Do you run a house battery? I just run one AGM cranker. I just have 136 volt for my trailer motor and then only run charge. My boat, they're in the process. I've already got dedicated power, but they're going to upgrade it. Mm -hmm. My boat's up here. Yep. I think my, I have a lithium crank in. I think mm -hmm. it's a A little bit of everything. Apex? Everything. One of everything? Yeah. <laughs> you think my battery would be sufficient? Like, I generally keep, say, around 12.9. Yeah, 125 would be plenty. Yeah. Yeah, 120 amps usually last. Yeah, it'll last. About 10 hours before. It keeps that on the water very long, so. Yeah. So it's the average fisherman, weekend warriors, or whatever else. Unless you're picking up interference. It just run okay off of the uh, starter. It, it sure will, I think. Yeah. In theory. 
what what we see a lot of times on AGMs, just because if you if you run it, if you cycle down an AGM a lot, it, like get it close to low voltage, mm -hmm. then charge it back up. Low voltage, charge it back up. Um, it, it has this tendency of getting sulfate crystals on it, and it, and it shortens its capacity basically. So you'll see that you know you might have got eight hours out of it for three months, and then after you know, four or five months, you start seeing it getting seven hours and six hours, then all the way down to half a day after about a year. It just, the AGMs don't like cycling down real far and then being charged back up. They like to maintain, you know, over 12 and a half volts all the time. So when you cycle those batteries down, you really reduce the life of them. Okay. It's, it's really been a big issue, you know, for people fishing full day tournaments. After they had that battery, you know, less than a year. Yeah. So the um, the non-AGM seem to have a lo longer lifespan, even though the AGMs have a three-year warranty. Uh, the one-year warranty batteries seem to last longer. Yeah. So, which is why I just did away with, you know, using. I mean, I didn't have a problem using it as my cranking battery, and using it for, you know, my lights and my live wells and stuff like that. And I dedicated just a. And that, a lithium battery to it, so I never had that problem again. Oh, okay. Yeah. So that's why I like it. The other reason I like the dedicated one. Yeah. As well, so you don't have to worry about cycling that battery for anything. Okay. And, and reducing the life of the rest of the battery. Yeah. yeah. What's the advantage over Apex over solar? So you are going to get a full HD display uh, and a little faster processor there. Uh, of course, you'll have dual Ethernet ports and some other things, but the biggest thing is bigger screen size, I guess 13, 16, and 19, but the biggest thing is it's going to have the best picture. The 360 comes alive. Yeah, it's going to have that full HD. It'll be the probably the clearest out of all of them. For whatever transducer you're running. Because you're, it's the same transducer as the Solars. Mm -hmm. So you're using the same thing. It's just, it displays a little bit cleaner. Does it have a higher resolution screen? It does. Full HD. Configure and network. Yeah, yes. There. So now, when you do that update, yeah, that it'll it'll connect like that right. every time. Just the, uh, you just have to go in there and reconfigure the network, and every time, but nope, it'll. As soon as you turn your boat on, they should connect immediately. So the new port is, is it just faster? It yeah, it is. Jams, yep. So you can connect five control heads on the new port box, plus accessories. I mean, it's just has way more power to run more accessories and more graphs than the old one. That should work way better on mine. Yep. You can actually run the old box. It's just an update thing to make the graphs connect, but the new port box is significantly stronger than, than the old one. If you weren't going to update your unit, but you had a, like a four or three graph system, would you recommend upgrading to the new port box? Mm, I would probably do that. Um, you can still run the old box when, and you update your graphs and it'll still make the connectivity faster. Uh, but if you're going to pile on several accessories up to five control heads, you're running like a full boat. I mean, a ridiculous setup like, you know, five or six graphs now. I mean, you're going to, I would 100% go with the, the new box, especially when you're jumping them. Because it would increase just the flow of your whole boat yeah. system. Instead of upgrading just the network hub, okay. can improve the whole performance of mm -hmm. the whole. Especially if you're network. running, if you're running the Solux and an Apex. Yeah. You probably won't see as much improvement. Because there's not much you. sharing on a Helix. It's just waypoints. Solux will share map data, sonar data. Well, Helix will show their uh, screen mirror, but. Solix will share all the mapping data, so you only have to have one card and it'll share to everything. Helix, you got to have a card in every one. Yeah. Yep. And, and then, so when you put the new box in, the, the first graph you turn on, that becomes your master. Correct. Yep. Or you just have to assign it. Yep. So it doesn't matter. You don't have to have a master unit. Is that, is that permanent master, or the next time you turn the first one on? 
it would be, yeah, it would be the okay. whichever one you turn on first. So you have to make sure you stick like with it where you want it. Yeah. Yeah. I have no idea. Yes. Same thing, just clear, have LED lights flashing for more or less service guys to see if everything's connected. I mean, you can peek in there and see if the lights are working, see if everything's actually working fine. It's more for us troubleshooting wise than anything. Since it is brushless, you're going to see a significant amount. I mean, it is, you're not, it's not near as interference prone because the motor's all changed. It doesn't have brushes in it, of course. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's quiet. it is very, very quiet. It is. Can you jump on the fish now? Yes. Yeah. Coming? Yeah. So, we'll have, like, usually in our trailer, we have an example, and I'll run it wide open, and you can't even, can't even hear it sitting there. Does it have better power efficiency than that? Yes. It's probably, it's way more power efficient. So you can even turn it on, but battery saver mode um, on that battery monitoring screen, you can turn it in eco mode just like your iPhone. If once it gets below 20%, you can turn that eco mode on there and it conserves conserve power just like your phone. So to chill out the motor just to make you last, you know, a little bit longer, get you a little bit longer runtime out there. And that's just when you hook it to a hummingbird. It won't, you can't do that on the app or the remote. The Quest and the Hummingbird go best together. Correct. <laughs> I've got a few people that daisy chain their units. Is, is, have you had any issues with daisy chaining? I have not as long as they keep the units on because, you know, if you're daisy chaining and you turn one graph off, then the one that it's daisy chaining to will not communicate, communicate with the other one. So as long as you just have to make sure everything's constantly turned on. All right, for those of you online, thanks for joining us. I'm going to sign off, and uh, I imagine there's going to be a lot of one-on-one -on -one questions. But, uh, yeah, uh, drop any questions in the comments, and we'll get, it, get you an answer as soon as we can. Hope you all have a great evening.